Hi, my name is Tina Ha, and I'm from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And on behalf of my co-authors, Dr. Corey Siegel from the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, Dr. Tom Almond from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and Dr. Asher Kornbluth from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, I'd like to discuss our study, Patients Enrolled in Randomized Controlled Trials Do Not Represent the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Patient Population. Although randomized controlled trials are currently the best approach to evaluate treatment effect, by limiting the available pool of potential study patients with strict inclusion and exclusion criteria, clinical trial results may have limited external validity. Therefore, the primary aim of our study was to assess a cohort of real-life IBD patients with moderate to severe disease activity encountered during routine clinical practice and to determine the proportion of these patients who would have qualified for enrollment in a pivotal biologic clinical trial. We hypothesized that only a small percentage of patients encountered in a consultative IBD practice would have been eligible for participation in a major clinical trial, therefore suggesting the limited external validity of randomized controlled trial findings. We studied consecutive inflammatory bowel disease patients with moderate to severe disease activity presenting to a tertiary care inflammatory bowel disease center for an escalation of their current therapeutic regimen. We extracted the inclusion and exclusion criteria from seven major published Crohn's disease trials as well as the ACT trial for ulcerative colitis and applied those criteria to our study patient population to assess trial eligibility. During our 18-month study period, there were 206 inflammatory bowel disease patients with moderate to severe disease activity who required an escalation in their current regimen of therapy. Of the 125 patients with Crohn's disease, only 34% would have qualified for enrollment into at least one of the seven included clinical trials. Of the 81 patients with ulcerative colitis, just over 25% would have qualified for enrollment into the ACT trial. Looking at the individual clinical trials for infliximab, adalimumab, sertilizumab, pegol, and natalizumab, clinical trial eligibility among studied Crohn's disease patients ranged from 8% for the SONIC trial to 27% for the CHARM and PRECISE trials. There were no significant differences between patients who would versus would not qualify for clinical trial participation with the exception of Crohn's disease patients with stricturing or penetrating disease. Forty percent of these patients had a symptomatic stricture or abscess, an exclusion criteria for almost all of the Crohn's disease trials. In fact, the most common reason for trial ineligibility among the studied Crohn's disease patients was the presence of a symptomatic stricture or documented abscess on imaging. The second most common reason was recent exposure to anti-TNF therapy or prior non-response to anti-TNF therapy, followed by high-dose steroid use and comorbid conditions. The most common reason for trial ineligibility for our studied ulcerative colitis patients was concurrent rectal therapy use. Other common reasons included steroid and immunomodulator naive patients, a new diagnosis of UC, or patients needing a probable colectomy due to age, comorbid conditions, or concomitant dysplasia. Because the majority of studied patients would not have qualified for clinical trial enrollment, we wanted to examine the subsequent therapeutic changes made for the trial ineligible patients. Approximately 50% of the studied Crohn's patients were started on anti-TNF therapies. However, ultimately close to 50% of these trial ineligible Crohn's patients went for surgery, either as a primary therapy or due to non-response to biologics. Among the trial-ineligible UC patients, the majority of them started either anti-TNF therapy or cyclosporine. However, approximately 25% of these patients required colectomy by 12 weeks. Since many of the patients who would not have qualified for enrollment into one of the biologic trials were started on anti-TNF therapy, we compared the response rates determined by physicians' global assessment to biologic therapy at 12 weeks between study subjects who would versus would not have qualified for enrollment. Among the Crohn's disease patients, significantly more patients who would have qualified for trial enrollment had a positive response to biologics compared to those who would not have qualified. However, there were no differences in terms of biologic response rates among the ulcerative colitis patients based on trial eligibility. Obviously, there are several inherent limitations to our study findings, first being that this is a retrospective study looking at patients seen in a tertiary IBD referral center, where patients with newer diagnoses of inflammatory bowel disease who are relatively naive to therapies are not as encountered as frequently compared to other practices. However, 
we found that the majority of patients seen in an outpatient IBD referral practice would not have qualified for enrollment into a major biologic clinical trial. Therefore, we believe that additional longitudinal studies with both community and academic center patients are needed to support our study findings, as well as to assess the long-term therapeutic response to biologics among these trial ineligible patients to truly determine the external validity or the generalizability of these pivotal biologic randomized controlled trial findings which guide the majority of our clinical practice.